fed the carousel into a projector, dimmed the lights, and projected images onto a wall for an entire lecture, every lecture, every week. Sullivan stood beside a long table, partially facing the screen wall and partially turned towards us and talked about the images. They were predominantly black and white. Each was carefully cropped and evenly lit. Occasionally, a handful was seen in color, illustrating paintings. Images were projected singly and from time to time in pairs for examining details and for comparative viewing. These are standard procedures in art history classes today. In 1958, we had never encountered such a situation before and did not do so in any of the other courses or subjects during our study. Its full impact was revealed when I embarked, embarked upon graduate studies in history of art in the University of California in Berkeley in 1962, where I was immersed in the compelling momentum of survey courses. Survey courses in which works of art and artifacts appeared majestically in ordered arrangement, filing through time and space, coherently, seamlessly, and with unfailing certitude. Images projected on the screen in pairs conveyed these passages powerfully and seductively. It was while studying in Berkeley too, in a course on art historiography, that it was revealed that the projecting of two images beside one another for comparative scrutiny was a teaching device initiated and perfected by Heinrich Wilflin in his sellout lectures in art and its histories in Berlin in 1920s. So you know where we have all descended from. Sullivan talked for the entire duration of a lecture for about 50 minutes, rarely pausing. About 15 images were projected. They were described, some in greater detail than others, all vividly and with aims of conveying the seeing of relationships and of connections between components visible in the images. Images were analyzed so as to indicate how one might discern the way they were put together, their arrangement, their design, their composition. There also were hints as to ways by which meaning might be proposed and assigned to images by referring to texts written by diverse hands and by carefully sifting cultural traits and tendencies and relating them to images specifically and generally. It is when dealing with this aspect that we were nudged towards developing a sense for seeing the images historically, of thinking how and why history might matter in talking about art. Sullivan wove description, analysis, and interpretation of content into intricate yet intelligible patterns of verbal representation. We had never heard language used as vividly, elegantly, and at such heightened levels of purpose as he did for talking about something else, and in doing so, enliven the seeing of that something else. None of this was heard as forced or labored, the focus was on the image, on the image, on seeing the work as it appeared projected on the wall. We did not hear what he was saying as replacing the image or as substituting the seeing of the image. Sullivan's description and analysis were heard as somewhat circling the image screened on the wall and at times as hovering close by. Tutorials were held every two weeks in the art museum and in a study in the museum. Let me just talk a little bit about this, the floor plan of the museum. Um, 
this is this is where all the, all the uh, artifacts and objects were displayed all along the corridor here. Uh, this was this is Sullivan's office, and that's the study room, which was really a haven for all of us. We felt that we were very special in a very special place, doing very special things, cut off from everyone else. And this was a connecting passageway leading to the study and to Sullivan's office. And in that passageway, at a table, sat Cohen Sullivan, whom I will talk about shortly. She was formidably, and firstly, his guardian, and then secondly, ours. To see Sullivan is to see Cohen. And we had to convince her why we wanted to see him. But she never, ever refused seeing him. But we just couldn't walk in and out. I like that. <clears throat> we were permitted in the tutorials to deal with objects in the collection. Here, too, we were guided into looking closely, looking at length, at the material makeup, at surfaces and shapes, at appearances, and then developing frames for describing and at times analyzing. We never ever lost sight of the artifact, even as we struggled with language awkwardly and ineptly to talk and write about a work. We were asked to deal with texts for submitting tutorial assignments. Just a minute. This is the exterior and uh, as it is now, and the museum was the entire length of this floor here. The entrance to it was through a passageway there and a doorway, and on the top of the doorway, I think carved in caps, bold, art museum. And I think it was laminated with gold. I recall the inducement encountered at the time of signing for the study of history of art in 1958 in Oi Ham Hall. It read, interest in language and advantage. Well, no other teacher in my undergraduate years employed language as Sullivan did consistently. And I'm not alone in re recalling his impact. I give you another voice. Jerome Silbergeld, currently professor of Chinese art history at Princeton University, was Sullivan's student while he was pursuing graduate studies at Stanford University, where Sullivan was professor of Oriental art from 1966 to 1985. Here is Silbergeld on his teacher, and I quote, Michael Sullivan was the last of my teachers. He has a wonderfully relaxed disposition. He's perhaps even a touch shy, very much a gentleman, and always gracious. It's hard to pinpoint how I most benefited from him, but two ways he inspired me come to mind. One is his eloquence. If you are going to talk about something beautiful, you'd better say it beautifully. Nobody talks like that anymore. You'd better say it beautifully, or you're not being true to your subject. Michael Sullivan had a real gift for communicating his subject. The other thing about him, and this is significant, is his extraordinary breath. Even among teachers of his generation, there are few with such range across geography and varied media, from Singapore trade porcelains to meeting of Eastern and Western art. There's hardly anything he doesn't have a grasp of. This kind of breath isn't possible any longer and maybe isn't even appreciated. But I admire it greatly, as humbling as it, is, as it is to compare oneself to, and I've somewhat resisted the usual degree of area specialization myself. Who was Michael Sullivan? <laughs> we finally get to him. I provide a brief profile. He was born in 1916 in Toronto, Canada, the youngest of five children. 
The family moved to and lived in England with brief stays in Italy and France. He attended boarding school and was brought up as, in his words, a proper English boy. Between 1936 and 39, he enrolled in Cambridge University to study architecture. The uh, cartoon on the right has flummoxed Sullivan because for one thing he said he had never ever played cricket. Um, <clears throat> on graduating from architecture, he worked in an architect's office, leaving quickly as prospects for developing a satisfying practice were limited. Don't we know that? Hmm. Even as his involvement in architecture was brief, it was useful in his later professional life. He joined five others and formed a pacifist group called the British Relief Committee, intending to provide medical supplies in, truck driver, in trucks driven by each of them to Republican factions in the Spanish Civil War. Plans to do so collapsed. In 1940, Sullivan joined the International Red Cross as a volunteer serving in China, which was reeling under the invasion by the Japanese. He was a truck driver, delivering medical supplies and, of course, copies of the Bible for Christian missions in cities in China. By all accounts, he was one hell of a driver. While stopping over at the Canadian mission in Chengdu, he was served tea by a young lady. This is his recollection of that day. One afternoon, Gordon Jones, who was in char charge of his mission, said, my wife is out, so Miss Wu is going to pour tea. She was wearing a simple chong sum with her hair neatly gathered behind her head. Later, she re reappeared in light blue slacks that fitted her slender form perfectly and a white shirt. She had loosened her hair, which now hung in a dark cloud about her shoulders. I had never seen a girl like this in China or elsewhere for that matter. Sullivan hasn't got around very much who looked so liberated and independent, so young and so beautiful. I was really surprised that she was already 22 years old with pre-med BSc from Santo Thomas the Jesuit University in Manila. She waved to us and was gone. The vivid moment was imprinted on my mind forever. End of quote, Sullivan. Yes, and how? He was smitten for life. Michael Sullivan and Miss Wu Bao Han, also known as Cohen, were married in 1943. She was a bacteriologist graduating from Santo Thomas Jesuit University in Manila, the Philippines. We do not presently know how and why she attended this university in Manila. As it is a Jesuit institution, it is likely that she enrolled in it on a scholarship or stipend from an affiliated mission in China. The Jesuits were active in China and were among the earliest Christian, Christian missions to set foot there. It is interesting to note that whenever the Sullivans traveled to China in the 80s and 90s, having returned to England, they frequently stopped in Manila presumably for Cohen to renew her connections there. This is speculation on my part. Cohen and Michael were inseparable. He repeatedly acknowledged how important she had been in his professional life. She made connections, she built bridges, she persuaded patrons in order to acquire works from artists and donate artworks to consolidate collections. While he was the curator of the art museum in the then University of Malaya in Singapore, she was his assistant, the assistant curator, doubling as his secretary, protecting him. As I said, she sat at a table in a connecting space between the study and his office. 
As students, if anyone wished to meet with Sullivan, we had to furnish a reason to Cohen and convince her of our need. She never ever denied entry or access to him, but it was regulated and not a free flow of movement. She was his partner professionally. This is interesting. Virtually all of his publications are dedicated to Cohen. This is, sorry, can we go back uh, to that one? This is uh, the dedication page to the birth of landscape painting in 1962. I'll come to that and we have a blow up for that to Cohen and the next. And this is a 1996 publication on art and artists of the 20th century with a dedication, again, a whole page devoted to that, of course, for Cohen as always. She was probably his first reader. Cohen facilitated Michael's entry into the world of art. Cheng Te Kun, a renowned archeologist, wrote to her, inviting her to be his English-speaking assistant at West China University in Chengdu. She directed that invitation to Michael, replying to Cheng Te Kun that he was better suited. He signed on as his assistant and lived in housing on the university campus. In this university was a collection of Tibetan artifacts. He set about learning to catalog them and in 1945 issued his first publication titled A Brief Introduction to Tibetan Culture. He assisted Zheng De Kun in excavating the tomb of Wang Jian who set up the kingdom of Shu towards the end of the Tang Dynasty. Other excavations followed. He recorded these by producing drawings of sites and artifacts and by compiling reports which were published. Sullivan says of these activities, and I quote, through working with Professor Zheng, I learned a lot about Chinese history and archeology span and about scholarly methods. I'm sure that it influenced my future development and gave me a firm foundation." End of quote. He studied brush painting with an artist named Guan Shan Yue. In Chengdu, artist teachers gathered in the Sichuan Provincial Academy, such as Pang Zhuangkin, Wu Zhuoren, Ding Chong, and Liu Kai Shu, who marked the vanguard of the new painting, the moderns. In 1944, the Modern Art Society in Chengdu held its first exhibition. Sullivan assembled notes from conversations with these artists from visiting their studios and viewing the works. Cohen was indispensable for these conversations and visits as he hardly spoke Chinese at that time. The material gathered from such meetings formed the basis for the first book-length publication in the English language on the modern in Chinese art. Its title, Chinese Art in the 20th Century by Faber and Faber, 1959. I remember this so vividly because we were in the second year of our undergraduate studies and Sullivan brought this book into the, into the museum and we looked at him in utter amazement. We were actually in meeting a writer all these books that we read on the shelves were persons whom we never knew of at all. They were just names, ghostly figures who wafted through these pages. Here we met an actual living writer who happened to be our teacher, Bingo. Hmm. I take enormous liberties in arranging for I must get him out of there, for quick exits from China for these two in 1946. Sullivan takes leave with these words, and I quote, I wanted to go home to England. I wanted Cohen and the family to meet, and I wanted to study art history as a career. Our luggage contained a few mementos of China. We had three tomb figurines, some Tibetan objects, and more important, were the modern paintings we had acquired from artists from Chengdu. It was an extraordinary privilege to be able to get to know so many highly creative artists and theater people 
at a time of great change in China. End of quote. Sullivan began studies in art history in the Courtauld Institute in London in January 1947, which of course had nothing to do with the teaching of Asian art. He enrolled there because presumably there were no accredited degree programs for majoring in Asian art history in the United Kingdom. While at the Courtauld, he submitted assignments on Michelangelo and Il Rosso Fiorentino whose work, he says, he disliked intensely. He left <clears throat> six months later and was then awarded a scholarship to study Chinese at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, for three years from 1947 to 50. In the summer of 1949, he organized an exhibition of Chinese art at Dartington Hall in the county of Derby, inviting William Cohn, Arthur Whaley and Basil Gray from the Department of Asian Antiquities in the British Museum to offer lectures. In 1950, Sullivan proceeded to Harvard on a Rockefeller Foundation scholarship for doctoral studies in Chinese art, completing it in 1952, and then on to a postdoctoral fellowship for two years in the very same institution. His dissertation was on the beginnings of landscape painting in Chinese art, the very first on this topic that was completed and submitted. It was published in 1962 as The Birth of Landscape Painting in China. This is my battered copy of it. By the University of California Press, Berkeley, which billed it as the first volume in the California Studies in History of Art. With this publication, Sullivan is installed in the epicenter of Chinese art history as a field. The majority of his writings, and they are on Chinese art, have been published by this press, University of California. I know of no other writer scholar in Asian art who is as consistently and singularly represented by one publisher. The birth of landscape painting in China is the first to deal with beginnings of the most esteemed picture category in China. Its scope spans from antiquity to the six dynasties, i.e. 581 of the Common Era. Sullivan surveys known archaeological, ritual, pictorial, and textual resources from available published Chinese and Western collections closely. He examines their formal, stylistic, and symbolic attributes, the three foundational criteria and grounds for the, history of, for the study of history of art then, ordering them <clears throat> chronologically. He analyzes and interprets these resources and attributes, directing his scholarship towards unfolding historical perspectives for appraising early representations of landscape in China. The account is piecemeal and fragmentary. Sullivan resists, resists temptations to coerce his resources into assuming smooth, rounded, and connected holes. Still, his aim is to provide an account that is historical. It is still the extant publication on the topic. In a survey of Chinese painting studies in the West published in 1987, the birth of landscape painting in China is listed as still significant. <clears throat> Even as it breaks new ground, its importance is measured in relation to past and prevailing studies. In this respect, Sullivan acknowledges his scholarly debt. In doing so, he discloses his art historiographical genealogy. Among those he names are Benjamin Rowland, William Acker, Lawrence Sigmund, and Alexander Soper, the, mo the master teacher scholars of Asian art history in the USA and in the English-speaking writing worlds in the 1950s and 1960s. And the 16 students who enrolled in the History of Art course as a subsidiary subject in 1958 in the University of Malaya encountered these scholars and read them attentively and reverently. 
in the art museum in the university was a study was a study in it were shelves of publications displaying a range of formidable tomes thick leather bound they don't do them anymore and arranged according to topics when dealing with art in asia we read three publications frequently they were art and architecture of india by benjamin rolan the art and architecture of china by lawrence sickman and alexander soper and the art and architecture of J japan by robert payne and alexander soper this is the cover can you imagine the cover of an art book called the art and architecture of china they were published by penguin and issued as a series titled the pelican history of art under the general Edit editorship of Nicholas Pepsner, an architectural historian. They were austere publications, heavy, heavy duty stuff. Each was made up of 320 pages, hardback. Two thirds were text with illustrations only in black and white, shunted to the back. You read page after page after page of text. You turned to the back in order to consult the illustrations that were mentioned in the text. You worked hard at matching text with image. In these publications, texts prevailed. <clears throat> when studying art in Europe, I recall one publication that accompanied us throughout the year. It was Art Through the Ages by Helen Gardner, which surveyed the art of the world, although focusing largely on European art. The Asian component was shunted to the last third and called non-historical art. <coughs> the same thing happens in Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture. It's a nice companion, the two. Nice topic for a seminar. At this juncture, I insert a digression, and in doing so, recall the birth of landscape painting in China. When introducing it earlier, I reported that it was published by the University of California Press, Berkeley, and as marking the first in a series of history of art. It is curious that the University of California Press Berkeley inaugurated its, its history of art series with a publication on Asian art. It is curious because Asian art was not taught in the Department of Art History at Berkeley at the time. This publication was issued in 1962. In that year, I arrived in Berkeley to ostensibly study art in Southeast Asia. I say ostensibly because on arrival at the campus, I was told by the academic advisor, I could not study Southeast Asian art as there was no faculty teaching it. <laughs> what is more, Berkeley had only then, in that year in 1962, fall, appointed René Yvonne Dajancé as professor of Chinese art history the first appointment in that field. I was advised by the academic uh, advisor that I would do well to study Chinese art history with the newly appointed faculty because after all, China is close enough to Southeast Asia. <laughs> I said, right, yes, and of course, and I studied Chinese art history. Could the publication of the birth of landscape painting in China be a harbinger then of the advent of Asian art history at Berkeley? The advent of Dajan Se, and let me go the whole way, the advent of Sabapati as the first graduate student in Asian art at this institution, which factually is the case. I completed my studies at Berkeley in 1965. In that year, Dajan Se transferred himself to the directorship of the Avery Brundage Collection of Asian Art in San Francisco. And in that year too, James Cahill was appointed as professor of Chinese art history at Berkeley. 10 years separated completion of his dissertation and its publication as a book. This is not unusual. Indeed, as we all know, the majority of dissertations do not see the light of day in any form. We loop back to that moment in 1954, to the end of Sullivan's postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard. As he tells it, Sullivan read an advertisement in the Times of London 
for a position as a lecturer in the history of art in the University of Malaya here in Singapore. He was surprised by it. He was also advised against applying for it as he would be heading nowhere in which there was nothing and that it would not advance his career. He applied anyway and was offered the position. He was, he reckoned, the only applicant. It is not improbable that he applied because he was curious. It is not improbable he applied because he needed a job. And that there were not many positions for an art historian in Asian art. And that, in my reckoning, he would be in a vicinity near China, which constitutes his field of study. The University Gazette announced that uh, Dr. M. Sullivan had been appointed as a lecturer in the history of art. Cohen and Michael arrived in Singapore in 1954. Finally, I've got them here. It was newsworthy to be reported. This is a press photograph. It was amazing that things like this were announced in the press. What, where have we got to now? It was newsworthy enough to be reported. There were two reports on consecutive days, July the 27th and 28th, 1954. On July the 27th, there appeared a short notice with a headline, an art man with a plus four job. And it went on to remark that Dr. Sullivan was walking into, in quotes, a no man's land, <laughs> implying that he was in untilled, uncultivated terrain. Sullivan was surprised to read the advertisement. Let us use that as a lead. Why was there such an academic position? After all, the study of arts history as an academic discipline was not prevalent in British tertiary institutions, and even less so in colonial outposts such as Singapore, Malaya. For clues, we step back a little, and to a report in 1948 by a commission set up by the Colonial Office in London for establishing a university here. It is referred to as the Carr Saunders Report after Alexander Carr Saunders, the chairperson of the commission. I just cut it to our point, our interest. It proposed that the history of art be taught formally at, an undergraduate, at undergraduate levels in the newly formed university. It recommended that a faculty appointment be made at a senior status, signaling, apparently, the importance it attached to the course and the position. As there is no indication why a so such a course be included and what it might be, it is assumed that everyone would know what art history is and of its intrinsic worthiness. The report gave, however, expensive reasons for its recommendations. It's interesting to read that. The teaching of history of art, it said, and I quote, would in fact fit well into many courses such as languages, literature, and history. How I wish it would. Hmm. It would be essential if at some future time, haha, architecture be taught at the university. Essential, mark you. When we began studying it in 1958, there were no connections between the learning of the history of art and the teaching of history and literature. And I know I was in all three areas. One was pursued separately from the others. Sullivan says as much in an interview, and I quote, I just did my own thing, good man. I was completely free to devise the course I wanted without reference to what was taught elsewhere. Of course, in the history department, they taught the history of Southeast Asia and so on, and the history of Asia and so on, as well as the West. So, of course, there were some parallel things going on, but we did not interlace or integrate these causes, never. End of quote. The claim that the study of history of art is essential for architectural studies is surprising. The report does not hint at how and why it might be so. Be that as it may, and I enter another minor digression, a school of architecture was established in the university in 1969. In 1981, 12 years later, 
the school decided to offer the history of art at an introductory level in the first year of studies. The aim was to widen the scope of students gaining access to historical sources critically and creatively, and to enhance visual acuity. I like that. In that year, I was appointed to teach this subject and continue to do so until today. <laughs> it might be a little mean to say this, but let me say it. When I was interviewed for this appointment, I mentioned to the panel, you know one does homework before appearing, I mentioned to the panel the recommendation in the Carl Saunders report, in which the history of art was esteemed as essential for architectural studies. My remark was met with a kind of benign silence. Sullivan arrived in September 1954. He needed time and resources to develop lecture courses a two-year curriculum for introducing the history of art was set up, and I've described it. He began teaching in 1955 and continued to do so until 60. The class of 1958, which I was in, was his last. In tandem with teaching, he suggested setting up a collection of art to enhance the learning of art's history. In October 1954, a proposal for setting up a museum was tabled and it was approved. On April the 7th, 1955, the University Art Museum was inaugurated. It was, in my reckoning, the first museum of art in Singapore and in Malaya. Sullivan was its first curator, thereby assuming a dual role, lecturer in history of art and curator of an art museum. The two are not necessarily compatible. During its existence between 1955 to 1973, the University Art Museum was oriented and developed along such a dual track. During his tenure, Sullivan elaborated upon, developed, and energetically publicized the aims of the museum, its programs, as well as teaching the history of art. He did so through exhibitions, by researching and publishing on art in a variety of print medium, by giving public lectures, and by engaging with art and artists in Singapore. His aims may be summarized as follows. One, to locate in the university a center for the study and enjoyment of art. Two, to provide a two-year program in the history of art. Three to create a center for research into the art and archeology span of Southeast Asia. Four, to bring together a representative collection of the art of those civilizations that have chiefly contributed to the creation of Malayan culture. In all these respects, Sullivan was entering unknown, unfamiliar terrain. His academic training was in Chinese art. Southeast Asia did not feature in it at all. Yet he was not deterred, committing his attention and resources unhesitatingly to grapple with new museological and archaeological enterprises. I provide details on some of these matters and, by begin, and begin by reporting on Sullivan's forays into archaeology. We recall his, associ his association with Zheng De Kun, excavating the tomb of Wang Jian, compiling reports on work undertaken on other sites while in China. He reprises his involvement during his tenure here, leading and partaking in excavations, especially in the state of Kedah, 